production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Verizon Foundation, supporting literacy programs and partnerships reaching adults and children across America on the web at verizonreads.net. Suddenly there was a paperback with Paul Newman's face <laughs> right. on it. Um, which I recommend to all writers, actually, <laughs> having, having, <laughs> having his face on one of your books. I joked with him afterward and said that, 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 that it had worked so well that we were going to put his face on the cover of all of my books. <laughs> Things are looking in bad, it said. Some of the town's residents claimed that the banner made no sense because of the arrow. Had a word been left out? Nobody's Fool, Straight Man, Empire Falls, Richard Russo is a funny guy whose sense of humor comes through loud and clear in his serious novels about small, seen-better-times industrial towns. Hi, I'm your host, Sandy Fippen. Richard didn't start writing until he was nearly 30. He was busy teaching college students for nearly 25 years. By the time he found teaching jobs that would allow him time to write, such as Colby College, he was making enough money writing books and screenplays that he didn't need to teach anymore. Rick, we're in your writing room. This is your space? It is. Do you write in the mornings? Mostly. Mostly? Mornings, afternoons. I have a session in the morning usually in mm -hmm. which I write uh, for a couple of hours. How early do you get up? Well, now, see, you, you, want, you, want to, you, you want everybody to know how, how lazy I am, don't you? <laughs> now, we're usually up uh, 7, 7.30, down at the Camden Deli uh, for coffee, newspaper, the beginning of my writing day by 8.30-ish. And then uh, back here a little later than that to, to start putting things on, uh, on disc. Do you yeah. write longhand first, did you say? First, yeah, usually, okay. still. All right. Put it on the computer either later that morning or early afternoon. That's the first revision. Right, the first one. That's right. Right. The first of, well, we, <laughs> we don't even need to, <laughs> to it, know how many. It, it varies, doesn't yeah. it? You were born in 1949 in Gloversville, New York, mm -hmm. and you grew up there. That's right. Describe what it was like growing up in Gloversville during your era, the 50s, early 60s. Um, I had a wonderful, enchanted childhood there, uh, which surprises people sometimes because I've, uh, I've written about upstate New York in a way that, that uh, has not prompted the Chamber of Commerce to use my books <laughs> to, promote, uh, to promote the region. But um, um, I had a wonderful childhood there. Uh, my, my mother and father were, were separated my mother and I lived in, in uh, a flat above my grandparents' house, which was difficult for my mother, but wonderful for me, because um, um, I had more loved ones around, actually, as a result of that. When my mother went off to work at General Electric in Schenectady, as, sh as she did every day, Monday through Friday, um, I had my grandparents around. My grandfather came home from the glove shop every day for, <laughs> for lunch. Uh, my grandmother was there, my aunt and uncle, uh, with whom, to whom I am still very close, and my cousins, who still live in Gloversville, many of them, were just down the street, so I had relatives there. It was the kind of growing up in a small town uh, that kind of took place. It was still fairly common then before the great diaspora uh -huh. of, of you know, family members moving to Florida, right. to California. Right. Um, the, family was, the family was all there. The support was all there. Uh -huh. Uh, my father would make cameo appearances every now and then. <laughs> it was a marvelous growing up that was tinged in some ways by an understanding um, that after World War II that this town, this region, had already seen its best days and that if you were going to be um, a young person uh, in the Mohawk Valley region, then you were just waiting for high school graduation, college, leave. whatever, to leave. And that's what I did. I went, as a matter of fact, although I look back fondly on my childhood there now, I suspect that at the time it wasn't, it, it, I wasn't as fond of the place then as I am now looking back upon it because I went to the University of Arizona 
oh. and, and could have gone, I had a New York State Regent scholarship where I could have gone um, Much cheaply. Much cheaper. Much cheaper, yeah. Um, but chose to go to the University of Arizona. I wanted to get very, very far away from Gloversville, New York when I was 18. <laughs> uh, part of the reason that I went to the University of Arizona, I suspect, was that my mother um, felt that I could not get far enough away from that small town and her sense that her son was going, would do better to make a life out in the world mm -hmm. somewhere. The two things, the two great gifts that my mother gave to me were, were first of all that, that fierce sense that she had of my destiny, which was not a small town destiny to her mind. Mm -hmm. Her sense for me that I could do whatever I wanted. Um, that and the equally, perhaps even the greater gift that she gave to me was her sense of reading. She would come home, I mean, she worked very long days, and at the end of it, she had more work to do when she came home. Um, and at the end of, um, you know, there was an hour to Schenectady from Gloversville. Mm -hmm. There was eight hours of the work there. Then there was an hour home. So now we're up to 10. Mm -hmm. Then she had to make her own dinner, so there's an hour, clean up the dishes, there's an hour, hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Then the washing, the ironing, the, the ironing mm -hmm. of shirts. All the housework. All the housework, all of that brings, brings us up to 9, 30, 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. at which time she would read. That was her great, that was her great um, reward at the end of the day, was picking up a good book. And that was the single, I think, the greatest gift that she ever gave to me as a kid growing up was to understand that that's what books were about. Right. That's the reward you got mm -hmm. if you were a good boy. Right. And I've never, I mean, even studying literature at universities never robbed that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> never robbed that sense. I mean, you can study literature in universities and, and have your relationship towards literature absolutely ruined by what gets stressed That's in those right. classes. And my mother's example was such that I have, and, and we don't read any of the same things, our, 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 tastes, are our tastes are very different, but that fundamental sense that this, in some way, a good book is as exciting mm -hmm. and rewarding as anything in you're life. ever going to do in your life. That's right. It's true. And that's what I owe. That's what I owe her most for. Did you go back to Gloversville when you were doing Nobody's Fool and Wrist Pool? The later oh, books? I still do. I still go back at to least see yeah once a year. Yeah. I still have um, uh, relatives that I'm very close to, and I still do go back. I don't go back very much anymore. But I was maybe once a year, something like that. Right. But I know that when you said you have to go away, which is true, you also have to go back sometimes to recharge or find yeah. out stuff, feel the old atmosphere. What happens to me anymore is that I've told so many lies about that place. <laughs> and those lies are so vivid to me <laughs> that when I go back now, everything's in the wrong place. <laughs> These people haven't learned anything from the stories that I've told them. I've told them what buildings have to come down. I've, I've rearranged all the parks. I've done, I've done everything that I could think of imaginatively in this town to make it the way I want it. And I go back there and these people are stubbornly living their own lives <laughs> as if I hadn't been doing all of this, this, this renovation. I've been renovating there for, uh, for over a decade now and I go back, I can't find anything, nothing's where it's supposed to be. Well, what do they say about you? I mean, do they, do they, do they read you a lot there? Um, back home. I don't know what they, my, my, my feeling is from talking with my relatives there that my relationship to the town is a little bit on the ambiguous side in the sense that, that um, many people there I think are gratified to have the kinds of lives that they live there validated in some way. To have someone paying attention to the kinds of lives that people live in, in places like upstate New York and, and inland Maine and, and down east Maine. Uh, and, and they're flattered by the fact that someone has cared enough about the kinds of lives that they live um, to, um, to set it down. And, and so, so the more generous, uh, and that is a generous view, I mean the, the more generous of those people from that from that neck of the woods is that. 
but but then there are I think a substantial number of grumblers too who who um, um, perhaps see me as validating things that they would just as soon not be validated, things that they would just as soon um, Got covered uh, over. Yeah, would yeah. just soon paper over. Right. You know, and so and also making fun of them. You're making fun of them. Yeah, there's there's that there's the the um, uh, I, I am a comic writer. I am a satirist, and I can't. I have a very difficult time taking anybody all that seriously, including myself. And so I think it's it's largely. Um, I'd like to think that the that the people who take issue are largely humorless people who are who are yes. <laughs> you know don't who, get it who, who um, perhaps just we're just looking for a little bit more dignity than than this writer. <laughs> A block down the street from Hattie's, two city workers were taking down the banner that had been strung across Main Street since September, where it had become the object of much discussion and derision. Things are looking in bath, it said. Some of the town's residents claimed that the banner made no sense because of the arrow. Had a word been left out? Was the missing word hovering in mid-air above the arrow? Clive Peoples, whose idea the slogan had been, was deeply offended by these criticisms and had remarked publicly that this had to be the dumbest town in the world if the people who lived there couldn't figure out that the arrow was a symbol for the word up. It worked, he explained, on the same principle as I Heart New York, which everybody knew was the cleverest promotional campaign in the entire history of promotional campaigns turning a place that nobody even wanted to hear about into a place that people actually wanted to visit. Nobody's Fool made the big difference, didn't it? I mean, when the movie came out, and, and oh. that was a breakthrough for you. It was a breakthrough not only for that book, but for all of my books. I mean, um, that movie, um, uh, because it came out at about the time, the paperback had been out for a while. But then suddenly there was a paperback with Paul Newman's face <laughs> right. on it, um, which I recommend to all writers. Actually, <laughs> having having <laughs> Paul having, Newman can help having having his face on one of your books. I joked with him afterward and said that that that, that it had worked so well that we were going to put his face on the cover of all of my books from now on. But uh, yeah, I do recommend that. That movie gave Nobody's Fool a double life. Mm -hmm. um, but it also had the wonderful effect of then rescuing the Risk Pool, and rescuing Mohawk. And um, suddenly there were um, maybe a hundred or two hundred thousand or a quarter of a million readers of a Richard Russo novel mm -hmm. that then when Straight Man came out after that, suddenly there was a, a readership out there for the next book. So it not only rescued the earlier books, it provided a platform for, um, mm -hmm. for subsequent novels. So it has made, oh, it has made a... All the difference. A huge difference, mm -hmm. and um, um, this new novel, Empire Falls, is is actually dedicated to Robert Benton. I don't know if you noticed that, but yes, uh, I did notice that. Benton and Benton made and the I film. have been. He made the movie. Yes, he's the he's the director and the screenwriter. And um, he made a good movie. It he was made a, good a movie. great movie. Mm, that's right. Did you did you think about being a kid, being a writer, rather, when you were a kid? No. Maybe? And, and certainly would never have thought of writing as a, as a means towards affluence. That's one of the first things that I tell students who are interested right. In, right. in being writers. Just understand that if, if yes. really, if you want success, you know, you, there, there, there are almost anything else you would choose to do. Well, that's right. <laughs> Professionally be would, be, an engineer. would be better yes, than, right. than, uh, right. than this. Um, and I'm very aware of the fact that as a, that as a writer in particular, um, I have achieved um, a... Um, a degree of um, of success that 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 is. Um, I mean, how many how many serious writers are there in America, who don't have to teach or don't have to have another kind of job or something that really pays the bills? Right. I mean, there are um, there are very very few right. of us, and um, I don't know how much longer it'll continue for. Uh, for, uh, for me, I always remind myself that the same mechanism that turns a, fa a faucet on also turns it off, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, so it could disappear. Um, it could disappear next year, uh, but for the meantime, um, uh, we are blessed. Straight Man <laughs> came along, yeah, and that was uh, your academic novel, and it's also in first person. It's your only book in first person. 
How come you no, did? risk pool is in first is that person first too. Person? Yeah, oh, is yeah. It? Oh, I slept those up are there. my two. Those are my two okay. forays into okay. into first person. But you prefer a third person, don't you? I've come to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because over you the can years, have, because you can do different viewpoints. Is that why? Right. I, and and two over the years. Um, um, third person, especially third person, omniscient. Mm -hmm. As you get older, and more arrogant. And more, uh, Want to play God. more aware of yes, your the suitability of of assuming a godlike stance. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, omniscience just allows you to have so much more fun. That's right. That's right. Um, and you can go in the heads of all these different characters. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's Fool actually started out as a first-person narrative, mm -hmm. and it was only when I realized that Sully who was beginning to grate on me, seeing everything through Sully's right. eyes, he was, he was as interesting or more interesting to look at than to look through. And so I switched that novel over to Omniscient, and, um, uh, and that was when I realized I really had the book, because then it was also at that point that I realized I could bring Miss Burl into it in a really meaningful way and get into these other characters' heads, which was of primary importance in, in that book. Right. Because I had originally thought of Nobody's Fool as um, the opposite of the risk pool. I was, uh, I, in, in the risk pool, I had told a father-son story through mm -hmm. the eyes of the, of the kid, right. which was very limiting, I realized. Uh, the, as the closer I got to the end of that book, I thought, all right, now I got to do it again, but I got to do it through the eyes of the father. Mm -hmm. um, much of the same story, mm -hmm. but told through a different perspective. But when I tried to tell it through through Sully's right. eyes. It was yeah. just so limiting I couldn't do it. Yeah. But they yeah. do seem similar, those men, oh, yeah. those men you write about. Yeah. yeah talk about yeah. working class guys like that who, whose dreams are gone with the wind. I earned um, enormous respect for men who did the work that I did during the summers but did it all their lives. And every one of them had dreams. Every one of them had some sort of notion of himself that necessity had had made impossible. The Straight Man is your most different book, yeah. in my opinion, because yeah. it's not about the working class, it's yeah. about college yeah. professors right. fighting over silly things, right. nonsensical things. Right. Scuffy the Tugboat, all right. of them yes. Yes. lost and abandoned, and, and the, believing they belong in the Believing they belong in the wide world, but scared to venture more than a oh, few inches offshore. Scared to leave yeah. their little dinky town in Pennsylvania yeah. because of tenure. Yeah. They got to keep yeah. their tenure and so yeah. on. It's just not, yeah. so true. Yeah. True here too in Maine, isn't it? Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, right. I think I think that there is, um, you know, I, it's not just college professors. I think we all, we all mistake what we want and what is good for us. We want right. an easy life. Right. You know, right. and we want security. Mm -hmm. And and not only do we want it for ourselves, we want it for our children. God, what a gift! Mm -hmm. What a what a gift to give kids. Yep, terrible. You know that that <laughs> sense that sense that you know be secure. Right. Do the safe thing. That's right. Find a job that you're sure will pay enough money. All this advice that we give our children it's is so tragic. It's much more fun to write about high school than college. Yeah. Because high school is still so dramatic, right? It sure is. Yeah. yeah. I my favorite parts of Empire Falls um, <laughs> are um, the high school parts. Mm -hmm. All the tick chapters right. uh, are really my favorite. And, it's, and it, has, it has in part to do with the, the fact that I just love those chapters. I love seeing the world through Tick's eyes. Yes. But it's, it's also um, just in a kind of autobiographical way. It's always going to have a very, very special place in my heart because um, my daughters were both in high school when I started writing this book, and this, this really is kind of a night sweat of a book, uh, of a father's worry about mm -hmm. what happens to, his to girls, right. uh, and, and, and Miles, as the father of a daughter, uh, is, is able to, to um, 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 envision, um, live through, um, deal with, things that I was hoping I would never have to envision, live through, deal with mm -hmm. as, as a father. But there was one period um, when um, I was still living in Waterville, teaching at Colby, that um, 
um, that I was asking every night. I was writing this book and I was asking every night of both of my daughters, what's going on in school today? Right, right. And um, 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 Emily was a, was a senior at the time. Kate was a sophomore. Uh, and Kate really got into the spirit of it. Um, and every day she was telling me, she was telling me stories that would happen. And, and I, would, I was trying to get her to, to tell me the real stories too. What's really going on there? Because I wasn't interested in, in, a, a, in, a, in, a, in a version that was censored for, for a parent. I really wanted to know what was going on. And she would tell me stories about, about kids and then we would fictionalize them. Every night after dinner we would go in and, I'd, and we'd say, all right, we've got this character here. What did she do yesterday? Let's, and we, uh, Kate, and, who I acknowledge, both of my daughters, but Kate in particular, because we wrote every night some of these kids. And um, so, so those sections of this book are going to have a special place in my heart, not only because I think they're the best in the book, but also because it was, that's going to be, I'm sure for me as, a, you know, as, as I grow older and my daughters are both in college now, um, um, both very much finding their own places in the world, I think that this book and those sections in particular uh, are, going to, are going to have a special place in my heart uh, for a long time. You wrote a wonderful description of a high school football game, though, in yeah. Empire Falls. Right. Which, right. seemed, which I interpreted as being between Waterville High School and uh, Lawrence <laughs> High School, Fairfield, because yeah, of yeah, Fairhaven. Yeah. Could have been, yeah. couldn't it? Down below, the Fairhaven and Empire Falls players were trotting back onto the field, halftime over. Janine did her best to act interested and upbeat. Yet, she couldn't help thinking how soon these limber cheerleaders now doing back flips would be married and then pregnant by these same boys or others like them a town or two away. And how swiftly life would descend on the boys as well. First the panic that maybe they'd have to go through it all alone. Then the quick marriage to prevent that grim fate. Followed by relentless house and car payments and doctor bills and all the rest. The joy they took in this rough sport of football would gradually mutate. They'd gravitate to bars like her mother's to get away from these same girls. And then the children, neither they nor their wives, would be clever and independent enough to prevent. There would be the sports channel on the television's wide screen, and plenty of beer. And for a while, they'd talk about playing again. But when they did play, they'd injure themselves. And before long, their injuries would become conditions. And that would be that. And the other, you also wrote about Orono and the University of Maine and a fraternity party. Yeah. And that would have certainly been true. I don't think we're going to be able to discuss <laughs> that particular scene here, Sandy, are we? No, <laughs> may, maybe not, but I think people might want to read the book to yeah, read yeah. about that scene. Yeah. Uh, and also the hockey team, the hockey uh -huh. team at, at Maine, because uh -huh. the, the boy that got a scholarship there. Or right, like. right. So, and you mentioned other things throughout yeah. the book, little main things here and there. Yeah. But you were careful. But it's actually not... A main you know, book. It's not a main book, no, really, when you come right, right down to it. I think that people who, who read this from Maine, who are, who are number one, looking, who are yeah. looking for a main flavor, a, a main flavor are probably mm -hmm. not going to find it because, in a strange way, it's much more like um, my other novels set either in New York or in Pennsylvania because these books are not about place. People always mm -hmm. say that I'm a place-oriented writer. I'm a class-oriented writer. Right. Yes, and this are. book... Um, with the Whitings and with the Robies and and um, these and with the kind of work that these people do, um, hopefully that is what is going to come to life vividly enough so that people any place see that's right. their place that's in right. it. I'm not a writer of place. I'm a writer of class. Right. That's right. Um, and yet, and yet yeah. the places are there. I mean, certainly it's a northeastern book. We could oh, yeah. say. Yeah. Because any any town in upstate New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, yeah. Yeah. They, they could identify easily. Maybe but, a, maybe in the Midwest too, but I've never yeah. been in the Midwest. But you know, Sandy, when, when, and during my in my travels, when I go out on book tour, and uh, I mean, I get sent everywhere. I get sent to the West Coast. Often, I get sent south. And um, if whether I'm in you know uh, Jackson, Mississippi, oh. or no matter where I am, there are oh. people who come up to me and and say, you know, your town that. What you wrote, that's my hometown. That's the town that I grew up in. Uh -huh. And I say, um, where's that? And they'll say, Jacksonville. Uh -huh. And I'll say, Florida? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? So do you see yourself, as you stay on here in Camden, as becoming a main character? 
in Camden, Maine. <laughs> Old Richard Camden, Russo. Yeah, yeah. He's this, down uh, to this, diner. New, this new book has kind of blown my cover in Maine. <laughs> I don't. I, I used to be able to walk around uh, downtown Camden. Uh, with a fair degree of anonymity, uh, which my guess is that, that Mainers are pretty sensible and this mm. book is, is uh, or at least the hype around it, will, will blow over as, as, get over as hype does. They'll get over <laughs> it and I'll probably slip back into the obscurity that I, that I enjoy fairly yeah. quickly. Yeah, as writers, writers need yeah. that. We need that. Yeah. Well, Rick, thanks so much for Thank letting us Thank you. Visit. I really enjoyed this. Wonderful world. Thank you very much. For more information about a good read, visit our website at mpbc.org. You'll find transcripts of interviews, biographies of each of the authors, a complete list of their published works, and you can join me on our new online book club to share thoughts about the writers featured on this series. Production of A Good Read on Maine PBS is made possible in part by the Verizon Foundation, supporting literacy programs and partnerships reaching adults and children across America on the web at verizonreads.net. I remember um, being told by uh, a number of very serious um, uh, nuns who were trying to make a serious young man out of me, uh, ambitious creatures that they were, that, uh, that I was never going to amount to anything if I didn't straighten up and, and, and fly right. And, and I take it as a great point of pride that, I, that I'm still around and they aren't.